Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you see me looking to the left, I've been a little surprised a couple of times. I looked over and wondered who that black guy was been watching me as a mirror. <laughs> background how I, where I came from. Uh, originally, uh, I was an engineer working in microwaves and video displays. And about 37 years ago, I came out from the East Coast and I worked uh, in Long Island. It's a wonderful Silicon Valley. Uh, I was probably one of the first field application engineers used by Fairchild. My primary job was to go around and help clients with engineering problems, design and applications of semiconductor products. Uh, in those early days, one of the first guys I met, oddly enough, was a guy by the name of Al Alcorn, who was the father of Tom. And I remember in the early days that Al, an old English a guy named Ted Dabney, had formed a company called Syzygy. That's S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. -Y. And Syzygy, uh, first development was a palm game that they dedicated to <coughs> quite on game. And they put it in a pizza parlor in Deer Hall on El Camino in Sunnyvale. And lo and behold, it overflowed the coins. At the same time, I was working on a project to build a device which is a coin-operated game that used the microprocessor. A lot of people in the industry swore that a microprocessor couldn't be used in video games, and I knew better. So I accepted the challenge and went out to design it. The name of the game was called Demolition Derby. And some of the unique features of it is that we actually had what we call coin defeat mode, which was a way of timing coin as it went through the switch closure to make sure kids didn't use slugs or wire to trip the switch down the machine. We actually had time the window and had it programmable that this slot time could be maintained in order for the machine to be activated. We also made controls for it that were optically encoded. Here to four before there were contact switches, there were pots, and the idea was to use optically encoded devices because they were more rigorous and could stand very well in a harsh environment. About that time, uh, I finished the machine. I was working full time for Fairchild. And they contacted me and had a company they were working with called Alpex that was doing something in the same order with the 8080 process. I was enlisted as like a secret agent to work with Altex in developing it to work with the F8 microprocessor, which was Fairchild's uh, homegrown process. Uh, the project turned out we ended up using the software, but I threw the hardware away with myself and a guy by the name of Gene Landrum. We wrote the business plan to write a uh, division for Fairchild, which was to go underneath their watch division to make games. Uh, we finished the whole uh, engineering task in a record time. Me and my guys ended up putting it in production in six months. Our management never understood that that was a record time. And we were considered mavericks because we didn't follow the rules of the game. But if we look back for a parallel function, we'll find that many other developments were maverick. Uh, you had to be a maverick to get things done because traditionally uh, there were people there ready to stick their foot out to say that's not the way it's done, it's done this way. Well, when you break, break new horizons, you have to break some rules. And we were rule breakers. We were known as mavericks, crazy guys. Uh, we did things that were really different. Even uh, the engineering department, we used to have a contest where we would uh, pop the bottle of champagne and see how far the cork would fly and give an award for it. And we had various contributions. Sometimes, instead of 
the mechanical and was doing it, our programming guys would do it on software on a CRT. Uh, we had one mechanical group actually make tandem rockets to, to blow the cork in this, up in the air, which ended up disastrous when they hit one of the cars in the parking lot. Uh, some of the other things that were a problem, is that we introduced the thing at the CES show in uh, 75. It was an instant hit. Uh, I remember having a booth that was like four feet across that was part of the watch booth. And I couldn't even go to the bathroom. I had to look at the sign and have somebody go in. We even had a crew of uh, people show up that did a photograph of the whole thing in a movie that they were going to show in Sweden. Uh, the hand controllers were very unique. The guy who actually made them into a reality was a guy by the name of you know, Nick, Nick Callisper, another guy by the name of uh, Ron Smith, mechanical engineering guy, kind of guy, and industrial designer. I made the first uh, model of it, the feasibility study that it could actually be made. Because here before, nobody thought of an eight-way hand control. You can actually pull it up, push it down, twist right, twist left, tilt back and forth, forward and back. So it had eight axes of control. In order to make it work properly, we had to simulate, since it was a digital contact, we had to simulate it acting like a analog device in software. And the way we did that was when you touch the contact together first, the movement on the screen of any object would move, would move slow and as it would stay, stay in contact, it would speed up in an exponential function. So you got to play with it and use it almost like it was a pot. Some people didn't know it wasn't a pot. So again, here was the power of the microprocessor being used to simulate other things. Our big problem began with the FCC. We entered into the FCC and we failed. And it was a whole uh, educational advance to work with the FCC. At that time, uh, people like uh, Apple had circumvented getting FCC approval because they didn't have an RF modulator. One of the rules that was unfortunate, people didn't realize it was going to comply with, is even an electric razor can be sanctioned by the FCC. If it radiates any noise of a certain level, the FCC can step in and have you disband that sale of that, that device. The reason why they got involved with us is that anytime you build an RF device that is a little transmitter, in order to get approval, the rest of the circuitry comes into play. And very few people fail because the modulator has problems. They fail because the other electronics come into their own. And where we were failing was we had uh, a radiation signal coming at a harmonic frequency that no matter what we did, we couldn't get rid of. And one of my guys, Will Alexander, and I, I remember many times working until wee hours in the morning trying to eliminate the signal. And finally, when I had an epiphany one day, after working until 2 o'clock in the morning, I went home and I was just bugged by the signal. And I called Will instantly, and Will was still up too. And I said, hey Will, let's go back to work and pick up out. And we went back to work, and I said, what is a quarter wavelength of 52.5 megahertz? And he looked at his calculator, and he the quarter wavelength, the wavelength the length was, I said, okay, now measure that hand controller from the base out to the end, right on the head. I said, uh-huh. We so were looking at a spectrum analyzer, and we saw the signal and we saw with a pair of scissors, and went, cut! And went, there it is! <laughs> we shortened up the hand controllers by two inches, and no more problems. And we took it to the FCC, and the FCC, again, would play games with me because of the big political rasm attack to get through them for a while. And we finally got through, and I was sitting in the lobby every day until it passed. I decided, why should I turn around and go back here and wait? I'm going to sit there. So every morning, I'd come to the FCC and sit in the lobby. And 
finally, after three days, one of the uh, chief engineers there came out of the lobby, kind of turned a great late to me and said, here's your number, go home. I said, we passed, right? But the big uh, interesting thing about the industry was that many people uh, were sitting in the lobby trying to figure out who Fairchild got. And I ran out like, I guess, assisting in Boys Town. I was really feeling good. At and ran out the door and then ran back in the door and I said, I'm the Fairchild guy and we passed. <laughs> well, from there went immediately to the airport and got on a plane to fly back here. And by the time I got here, the news had beat me back. Because at the time, the other competitors in the business we're all talking about making dedicated games, and they were so afraid of the cartridge concept that it was going to put them out of business. Because instead of having a dedicated game for each function, this cartridge thing that was going to sell so the cartridge would go from 29, uh, 1995 up. It was a big blow to them, and they kept claiming that the only reason is that they won't pass FCC. They won't pass FCC. When we passed, they had a nightmare. But close on our heels for another year was a company called Atari. As Atari came in into the marketplace. Uh, it was interesting, the first year we brought it out, Fairchild was not used to consumer business. They were not used to even making watches. I made a prediction that the watch business is not the sizz of beautiful electronic watches. It's the jewelry business. And that people care less about the intricacies of what's inside the watch. All they care about is what it looked like. And I told that the Fairchild owner over, and they kept saying, oh, no, we got the technology. The technology does the stuff. Technology is what is, makes the product easy to manufacture, makes it cost effective, makes it steady, but it doesn't sell the product. Well, first day after Christmas, in the consumer business, is called Hell Day. And that's the day that all the toys come back to the store because they don't work right, or Mildred doesn't like it, or Junior wants something else. And that's the day that all your customer resources have to be in place to receive calls. Well, our marketing department was rather lax, they took off. And I made the mistake, and since the whole plant was closed, was well, I'm getting caught up on my paperwork, so I went to work. Me and the guard were the only two in the plant. And the phone call started coming. And they came. I had a Hollywood movie star call me and tell me what a great thing it was. And how they enjoyed it, what we could do with it. Then they started getting frantic. I had one guy who called up that was really mad because he had taken the game completely apart, all the screws, everything, looking for the batteries. <laughs> and I said, sir, plugs them to the wall. But still, where's the batteries? Okay. I had one other call. Will dog urine hurt the game? <laughs> dog urine? <laughs> If Schnauzer lifted his leg when he first saw it and let it have a dose, right? We got one one time where somebody cut down, we purposely made this cartridge not the same dimension as an 8-track tape. Didn't make any difference. They will make it an 8-track tape. <laughs> and we had people carve down the cartridges and carve down 8-track tape to try to shove them in the machine to play. <laughs> Well, you can imagine, since I was not in marketing, I was in engineering, that toward the end of the day, I was getting a little frazzled. And a woman called up, and she said, My game hums! Do you know why? And I said, Because it don't know the words, lady. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so you got kind of burned out of shape with all that. And some of the things that happened were quite amazing. We had a crew of guys, for instance, some of the things that Fairchild Town had never received credit for. We actually made the first precursor of that man. It was called Maze. And Maze was a game that it calculated 10,000 different mazes. 
And if, if the game was played with two players to go through the maze, and the maze had several modes. One mode is where it was completely invisible. And you were banging against walls that had no idea where it was. Another mode, you actually left the trail. Then the, the guy programmed it, developed another function for it, which was called the cat. And the cat would come in the maze and gobble you up. Now, one of the bad points we used to have is that my poor kids to the day, and they're now in their 30s, they were the pioneers of testing games. And I would bring games home for them to play to find the flaws in And uh, lo and behold, the kids were making games out of the flaws. And it was funny because we never got the true information back from them. They would make up another game, uh, like they found a way they claimed to get the cat sick. My son told me one time, he was all of about, I guess, three years old, four years old. He used to know where the cat would go. And I said, you can't know where the cat goes. Random maze. He said, I know the maze. I said, how do you know the maze? He said, if you take the button, reset button, and you hold button one, and you let go of the reset button, you get the same name. It was right. <laughs> and it never timed out. So he knew the time function. He memorized the maze, and he knew where the cat was going to go. He also had a problem with one of the games we called dodgeball. Dodgeball, where we had two squares that were players, that balls were coming from all sorts of idea, uh, angles from the screen and uh, collide with you. And the kids found out if you took both players and superimposed them over top of each other, when collision occurred, the blue guy would always get the points. It was a flaw we had in real life. They found it. And they played it. They would for, I want the blue player. Oh, I mean, right, it's the same thing. No, it isn't. Right. They knew.
device on the system that had a cable box which was housed underneath the channel F and a cartridge mechanism cable which powered the game and powered the, uh, the adapter box. The cable went into the back of the adapter box and you turned it on, it gave you a menu of all the particular games. You would select the menu and this was an endless loop of data. And it would pop that particular game, download it, say it's okay, and then play. And it was unattended and running for about two years in Santa Clara. Fairchild again couldn't get their act together as to how to deal with it. And then teleprompter themselves changed and uh, fell apart. And I understand people have revived it and said it's a brand new concept. Yes, it's brand new. It's working in 1977. Any questions? You guys are quiet. He agreed about that. <laughs> I got one question. Is sure. Can you get ex like explain how physically that that TV power is sold it? Okay. What it was was a game system one. Uh, the output connector was normally an RF signal on channel three or four. We built a video amplifier inside. Okay. So that we brought out it's strictly just a video signal. Okay. That video signal went into the network on the TV station. They had video lines with cameras and everything else. It came to mind with the camera line. Okay? They could switch it, the technical director could switch it in and out from broadcast. You could sit there and show your pictures of them and kick it over to where it was just, that's all you saw was that on the screen. Now, in order to activate it, we built the hybrid. And what a hybrid is, it allows the announcer to talk because it greatly attenuates his voice into the system. And it, and it amplified the voice from the phone. So he could talk on the phone to the person and not trip the system. Could more than one person be on that game at the same time? No, only one. So if you were watching TV, if you if you're watching that channel, you'd see someone playing that game? No, it was only for the, for a, 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 audience reaction to that particular thing is, we're going to play TV now, now, okay? You call a person, one individual. You've been selected to play TV now. Oh, okay, right? And then you'd be on your phone, right? Then they would say, okay, switch it over and it's on broadcast. But everybody would watch the target, run it up and down, and would say, okay, pop! And you'd fire a projector, okay? Yeah, they, they typically ran it as a contest. Yeah, kids would send in a postcard or something, and they would pick a postcard random and call one lucky winner each day. Yeah. Um, me and my brother actually got to do, got to play that. So. <laughs> you did? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way back. Did you win? Unfortunately oh, not. Unfortunately I, not. I chickened out. The, uh, the real strategy is just to keep going pow, 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 as fast as you can, because... Yeah, that would have worked. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Solid video, just finesse it, pow, try to actually get the timing right. Didn't work. <laughs> what we used to do is that uh, Mike Glass, I've got to tell you about him, he was the first guy to put Easter egg in a video game. I found it the hard way. What was that? Uh, one day, uh, a service department came over with a cartridge that was defective, and it was Spitfire. And the manager says, I think you need to see this, Jerry. Um, he gave it to me, and I showed it in my machine, looked, and I went, oh my God, all right? And I told my secretary, get Mike over here, quick. Yeah. Mike comes walking in my office, and he looks, and he says, oh no. I said, yeah, oh no, you tell me how this happened, right? I said, who would have known a car would have broke down and done that? And what it was, it was, it was a text that said, programmed by Mike Glass. <laughs> and he had us, I said, okay, how you get it? And he told me the code, he pushed the buttons in a certain sequence in a certain amount of time, this thing would come up. And he would go around to different department stores and set them off like that. <laughs> but, but he was, like I said, he was a very, you know, there's a big difference. One of the things that I try to tell people, there's a big difference between a programmer and a gamester. And a lot of people don't understand the difference. Mike was a gamester turned programmer, okay? And in that mode, he was able to understand what it took to have a good game. For instance, 
One of the functions of a game should be an attract mode. Because you'd be surprised how many times I've seen people play an attract mode thinking they're playing the game. And I'm sitting there telling them it ain't working, right? You know, you're not playing it. It's not you, right? I even had a guy that one time we asked Mike to make a demo card to show the people how to operate the hand control. They said it was very difficult. So Mike had one that was so interactive, if you turn the control the wrong way, it would say, turn it to the right. And if say you turned it to the left, it would tell you, you turned it to the left, I said the right. No. It said pull up. No, no, not down up. That's how interactive it was. Well, I watched the guy at a CES show, and one of the things that started is that when you push the reset button, it would say, please do that. Do not push the reset button. I watched a guy for 10 minutes push the reset button. <laughs> it said, please do not push the reset button. Please do not push the reset button. And I'm looking at him, I said, sir, uh, it's asking you not to push the button. Why do you keep pushing it? Because, huh? <laughs> I thought I'd gone up for him. <laughs> and we had one in too, but I got blamed for it because uh, one of the favorite things in one of the games is that in tic-tac-toe, it says, you lose turkey. Well, the reason why that's there is that that was my favorite term. Was that one time, you know, something went right, oh, you turkey, right? And one of the programmers said, let's change it to turkey, right? And they put it in the guy left it there. said, OK, fine, stays, OK? <laughs> uh, but, uh, a gamester knows how to make a device or game fix. Mike made the games adaptive. Spitfire, which ended up oddly enough being featured in the movie The Fury. That movie, one of the things that was different about Spitfire than anything else, it's a airplane game where the computer flies an airplane, you fly one. The computer flies one of the planes. The way it works is that if the plane, the computer plane keeps shooting you down, it slows up. Every time it knocks you out, it slows down. So that you can finally hit it. And then when you hit it, it speeds up. So as you keep hitting it, it keeps getting faster and faster. And it's adaptive. Mike, being a gamester, said, that's how you gotta do a game. If you come into a game and you're an instant expert at it, you don't like it. But you got to have some criteria that you can grow with the game, improve with the game, and learn the game. Okay? And he said, this was some of the conditions that a gamester recognizes and the variable functions of a game. The scenarios are different. How many different ways you can go with the game. This is important in order for you to size up how to do a game. And like I said, Mike was very good at that. Uh, we've had other people that they were programmers, but they weren't gamesters. Everybody understand that concept? Guys, you were awful quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in technical terms, how much uh, memory RAM and ROM is the third challenge? That question's not allowed. Not allowed. It used a screen memory all together the 16K. Uh, the screen memory, incidentally, one of the things everybody complained about the resolution, but in order to double the resolution in using screen memory in this mode, you had to quadruple the RAM. And the RAM was very expensive. In fact, what happened, uh, one of those side stories was when we first finished the game, I literally used to go to the MRS division of Fairchild with a red leg. And I would go to the MRS chess department floor, and I had a deal to pick up all their faves. And all of their chips were in boxes, thrown together. And I would stick them in my red wagon, drag them downstairs, fill the elevator, take them to my car, put them in my trunk, and take them to another test lab, and to the spec I needed, I was getting 75% yield out of that garbage can. So, hey, this is great, you know. Well, they found out about it, and they decided to charge me. 
and I went to throw and quarter the guy. I was told by a big man, leave him alone. And they started charging us two dollars a ramp. And when they finally couldn't deliver those, we ended up having to go to Intel, which Intel felt was kind of funny that Fairchild was one of my parts from them. And they kind of had to convince them that I had nothing to do with Fairchild Semiconductor. We were Fairchild Video Division. And they finally sold it to me and of course they were uh, screwing over me and they charged me a bunch of pork. So I tried to show our wonderful president how much we were getting hosed by our own company. But as far as the ROM content was concerned, to answer your question further, the way the ROM was instituted in the F8 process is that the ROM was called a PSU, Program Storage Unit. And it wasn't simply just a ROM. It was a ROM and it was IO ports. And what it allowed us to do is that we could stick other peripheral devices into the cartridge. In fact, you'll find one of our cartridges, which is the chest cartridge, it has peripheral devices like even has an LED light to show you when it's planning to move. And that was due because it used the IO ports in the PSU. Does that answer your question? Partly. Uh, how big were the problems? They were 2K. <coughs> 2K bytes. No. Oh. No. Oh. The game had 2K internal, okay? And what we did was <coughs> there were certain routines, exec routines, that were in the base unit that the cartridges called out. So it wasn't just native code that was instituted in the cartridge. We would call subroutines out of the basic unit to cut down the, the uh, ex excess memory. So in other words, like for instance, one of the uh, routines we use quite a bit was called self-erasing characters. What a self-erasing character is, is that you take a block of memory, and when you put a character, a dotted character within that block of memory, you didn't cover the whole block. You left the border around the block because when you moved it, it would automatically erase itself in the next position. So it saved the routine of having to clear it out and write it again. When you took the whole block and moved it, it erased the other position within, so it was self-erasing. So that we used that, and it saved a lot of time in trying to move the character around, and a lot of heartache. Uh, you know what the uh, list price was when it first came out? Yeah, it was, uh, it first came out at 149. Then they reduced it on me without having the cost reduction. In fact, we have, um, we went through a couple of iterations. The first model one, we did all the logic in it with the uh, SSI, MSI parts to get the marketplace as fast as possible. The next iteration was to make LSI chips out of those. So even the board was massively big because we wanted to maintain the same case size and form factors. So we had these three ICs that covered, you know, the board was about 10 times as big as it should have been. So it wasn't until we got to this next model we were able to reduce the board down in size and take advantage of the force reduction. It sounds like you were uh, uh, technologically more advanced than Atari, from what you said, uh, the Atari 2600. Yeah. Well, in a way, I don't know, I, I wouldn't put them down that way. But what, what was happening was that we were a manufacturer of processors. Uh, Atari was a user of We had some problems with system definition. See, Atari approached the market from a system point. We as a corporation approached it from a component point. In fact, when they first decided to do this, the way the company was going to structure the division, I was going to be in charge of applications. And they finally told me they didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't applications, I was running all this 
show and I ain't doing that. Right? This is not an exercise to make a silicon. And we finally, even I, I had to have several fights with our sales department because all they wanted to do was go out and find customers to sell the chips to. And they said, uh-uh. This is our division, and we don't sell chips. Period. Goodbye, right? It was a lot of smoke rays about again. I was a rebel. Because in their mind, you know, they sell chips. But you know, Fairchild had a few other spoilers like I'll never forget one time. They we were in the watch business. And I saw a commercial they made for watches. And I was in the back of the room and I was in tears laughing. Well, it didn't ingratiate me to the rest of the management. And they heard me laugh. And the way what this commercial was, was there was a guy climbing up a mountain, okay? And he had a Fairchild LED watch. And I'm in hysterics. So finally, my vice president said, all right, Lawson, what are you laughing at? I said, that is the dumbest effing commercial I ever saw in my life. Look at me, I like it. I said, okay, if you like it, it wasn't no good. So first of all, a man does not climb mountains and worry about what time it is. I said, he climbs a mountain, and when it looks the sun is going down, he goes down the mountain. He could care less if it's 11.02, 12.00, he doesn't know, he doesn't care. If anything is trying to get away from a watch, it's mountain climbing. Second of all, he can't see an LED watch in the daylight. Right? Outside activity, the LED watch can't see it. And then third of all, he needs two hands. <laughs> so how does this make any sense? Uh, again, uh, I look. Well, they put it on TV. And Sonny and Cher put a spoof out on it. I never laughed so hard in my life. I thought it didn't work. <laughs> they had Don Barrett standing on the mountain. Sonny Bono was climbing up the mountain and gets to the top. And they, they see you got one of those electronic sized watches. He said, What time is it? He goes, It's fun. <laughs> 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 you know, so they, there's a few movies like that. But like I said, it's interesting. And I kept trying to tell them, I said, You know, Sooner or later, they kept thinking of dreams of being able to wash out people like uh, Timex. And I said, I doubt if you're going to wash Timex out because Timex is in the watch business. It's jewelry business. They know their stuff. It, electronics is just a means to an end. Replace them with gears. That's all. And in time, they'll take it back because they know their business. Yes? They bought a TV pal. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, so it's, it was actually voice activated, or was there a guy synchronizing your computer? It was actually voice activated. So, so you could say, oh, wow, it would fire yeah. at the same rate? Uh, it, was, it, would, it would fire at the same rate as operating the hand control. Right. And there was no, no synchronization, because that was the whole concept of that. It was the user doing it. Otherwise, it would have been a sham. Yeah, I was worried about that. No, it was, <laughs> uh, it was true, it's true, good. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Who owns the rights to all the Fairchild brands? That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, Zircon. Zircon owns some of the rights. And I don't know. What, I used to do work with Zircon at the Fairchild School of the in fact, some of the cartridges that Zircon kind of released, I was involved with. Uh, anybody knows who Zircon is? They make a thing called the Stud Founder. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> no, guys, it's not that kind of stuff. <laughs> Someone else, yeah? What, what happened to the first job? Uh, which division? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the game unit. <laughs> Well, what happened was Fairchild, Fairchild is not a consumer marketing kind of company. And when they hit the first bump in the road, they panicked. In fact, the way it even panicked was that the first bump we hit, they wanted me to lay off everybody. And I said, no. In fact, I 
kind of a little upset and said, uh, why don't you take me, right? And then that was a little power play after I made, didn't do it. Then the next time, they uh, decided to make it real. And I couldn't do anything about it. They didn't know how to handle competitive business. They don't know how to market in the area of consumer or anything of that sort. They just don't know. <coughs> it's not like dealing with semiconductors. You know, semiconductors, when they, somebody says they sold semiconductors, you didn't sell semiconductors, you made them available. The world bought them for you. You didn't sell them. All you had to do was, I can tell you right now, I used to be in uh, Sigmetics with uh, the memory manager. A marketing thing was easy. Give me the fastest, biggest memory you can make in itself. And that's still true today. So if you tell me about the marketing aspect of it, that, that's an automatic thing. But when it comes down to saying, okay, my memory is not as fast as yours, maybe not as dense, now what can I do to sell it and lay it kind of marketplace and how do I support it? That's marketing. And I've always learned one thing. I'd rather have the world's crummiest product with a good marketing department than the greatest product with a crummy marketing department. It's like the same thing in, I'd rather be guilty with a good lawyer than innocent with a bad one. Same thing. Somebody else? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Was the TV pal based on the, the channel at hardware, or was it a totally different thing? No, it was totally uh, channel only. Okay. Good time for uh, two more questions, or so. Is it possible to take some hundred controllers? Yeah. It's <laughs> possible. <laughs> 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 Well, the problem with them is twofold. You need four hands to close it. No, I can do it with one hand. But this, this, the problem is, is that the wiring is pretty foreign and long because of the flexibility. The other one the problem is that the plastic plunger in the middle, they broke because we used, the manufacturer used what was called regrind. When you make plastic parts, in order to give them strength is that you don't use too much regrind because it, it fatigues the part. In a lot of cases, that was causing a problem. People hit it against the stop and snap them off, okay? The other problem was the, the metal contacts. We didn't run a lot of current through those contacts. So what you really need to do periodically is to go in it and just clean it up. Take yourself a Q-tip, walk up and down inside, clean them up. A lot of times that would fix them. Anything else? Thank you guys are easy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else? So, so TV Power was the first uh, voice activated video game or TV? I believe so, yeah. 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 And uh, also the channel left is probably the first cable operational game too. And in the first Easter egg game, that Easter egg thing. So again, like I said, we, met, we never received a lot of credit for it because it just wasn't advertising. Right but there were a lot of little side venues of things that happened that uh, were quite interesting about uh, Channel F. But again, I uh, you devote a little bit of your life to it and you kind of go, you get a little sore spot when you don't see something fail to somebody doesn't push it hard enough. Back hurts. Oh, what's the back of the room? They're pushing it out? No. No? <laughs> okay, so did you guys have any, well, one of the other things, I had broad stuff here, but uh, again, we can't demo it maybe later. But like, uh, these are, look for our prototype printers, which we use standard ROMs. <coughs> Normal PSU that was in here. And then it took another 10 years for everybody else to discover, hey, you can do that. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, like, unreleased games or, you know, like Yep, those? yep. I got some on here. Awesome. And are those ROMs all uh, dumped or whatever on the internet, like on a desk? 
it will be done because we don't know about it. <laughs> the question is, will they be, I guess? Ah, ah, okay. The answer is, somebody else do it. Okay. Okay? okay. <laughs> they are here. Several games here. Like, even have a, a 2600 game we did at Video Saw, which is 3D, which uses red and blue analytic devices. It's called 3D Ghost. Was that for a monitor? No, we did other games for Amiga. Okay. We, in fact, one of the things we had, I started a company after Fairchild was called Video Soft. And we did uh, games for Amiga. We also did games for Milton Bradley, Parker Brothers, and, and Mattel. You did the color watch anyway, right? Yep. Yeah. I got, found two of those.